We start out with a look at the obviously most dramatic and compelling feature of that history from the 1930s, the sit-down strikes that began in Detroit in 1936 and peaked in 1937 and really established the basis for a new kind of labor movement. The picture you see here, obviously a posed one, is on the roof of Dodge, Maine uh, in March of 1937. This was the biggest sit-down strike uh, in U.S. history. Roughly 6,000 workers seized the factory, barricaded themselves inside, and demanded that management obey the law. The law being the National Labor Relations Act that had just been passed that established rights to actually advocate for and organize on behalf of unions without the threat of uh, management reprisal, firing, discriminatory uh, actions that would discourage union organization. That law had been passed in 1935 and then ignored. It was nullified in the courts and employers simply ignored it, continued to fire people, continued to plant spies among union organizers, basically violating the law. In a way, the sit-down strikes were kind of a massive law and order movement. Um, it was almost uh, basically an, an argument that said the lawbreakers are the corporations. We're here to insist that they obey the law, recognize our rights to organize, and the fact that we have a majority support within the membership. Now, they pared down the number of strikers uh, and remained in that plant for 17 days. By the way, on the same day, six other Chrysler factories had sit-down strikes. It was a simultaneous movement across Chrysler Corporation. Uh, and they pared down the number of sit-downers to a more manageable number that they could feed and um, mobilize effectively on behalf of sustaining that. They, they defied the sheriff and the court injunction that ordered them to leave, and they remained in that plant until they won their demands. Now, this was part of a larger movement across the United States, but particularly peaking in Detroit. There were 500 sit-down strikes across the United States in 1937, motivated by the same interest in forcing employers to obey the law and recognize the rights of workers to organize for concerted action. But in Detroit, over 130 sit-down strikes, 35,000 workers, not just in auto, but in a wide range of industries, uh, including downtown retail establishments, hotels, restaurants, coal yards, trucking companies, meatpacking plants. Uh, and in fact, what's sort of interesting about this, more, more than sort of interesting, what's really compelling about it, is that they were organizing whole industries all at once. And the contrast with today, and for any of you who have had any experience with organizing, is really telling, because today it tends to be a piecemeal, one by one, one workplace after another. Very difficult to win effective collective bargaining when you only have one isolated workplace in a corporation that may have hundreds of such places across the country and dozens within the particular region you're in. In this case, 1937, you had every downtown hotel occupied and they won an agreement that covered most of the downtown hotels all at once. Uh, likewise with all of the industrial laundries, likewise with most of the restaurants in the downtown, certainly all of the supplier plants, Chrysler all at once, a massive strike wave, almost like a rolling general strike. There were 35,000 workers who barricaded themselves inside their workplaces in basically four months of early 1937. A successive round, one industry after another, like a rolling general strike in effect. Um, and what's interesting about this, it included, by the way, the cigar industry. Uh, and a lot of people are puzzled to see that there was actually a rather sizable cigar industry in Detroit. It was the mechanized portion of the industry, as you can imagine. Cigar making had, until some years before the 1930s, been characterized by hand rollers. Uh, in this case, we're talking about the mechanized, cheaper cigars. 2,000 cigar workers concentrated in Hamtramck and Pole Town. And here again, it wasn't just one plant that went out. It was all five of the major plants at once. 2,000 women who barricaded themselves inside those factories and demanded that they'd, be, that they'd be represented by a union that would include them. And I'll get back to that in just a bit. The lessons we want to draw from the events we've just briefly looked at, and I'm just showing you the, the greatest hits of a, of a history that is compelling and really deserves, obviously, a lot more attention. But we want to move to a look at today and what this is all about. And if we're going to draw lessons for today, the first thing that has to be recognized is how bleak the circumstances are that we confront in terms of union organizing. And I want to draw your attention to this quote. And it's important to keep in mind that this is, this is actually a pro-labor analysis. This man, George Barnett, was actually sympathetic to unions. It's a regretful assessment. It's not a, an effort at a self-fulfilling prophecy by some anti-union authority. This is a sympathetic soul 
who believed in unions but saw the prospects uh, for future growth and organization uh, as pretty narrow. And he points to changes in the law, growth of large corporations, but he draws particular attention to occupational changes and to technological revolution as elements that will contribute to the downfall of labor, the decline of the labor movement. And he then makes a prophecy, it's rather wordy, as many academics often are, um, <laughs> but as you can see, um, it, the short and sweet of it is, or the short and sour, I should mm -hmm. say, is that he expects that this will continue into the, at least the near term, and that the labor movement has little prospect of recovery. What do you think he has in mind, by the way, with these items here? And I, I, one thing I forgot to say, I want you to raise your hand and interrupt when you have questions or comments. I'd rather not wait till the end, so do, do so as we go. And right now, what do you think would represent the kinds of occupational changes, technological revolution, or for that matter, any of the items above it as well? You had your hand up? Yeah, I mean, deindustrialization. Okay. Like the shift, you know, uh, a lot of where people are getting employment is not, you know, coming out of high school is not at the factories anymore. It's at either you know, restaurants or warehouses. The service sector. The service sector. At the right. high and the low, the high tech exactly. and then also the low tech and low wage usually as well. What else strikes you here? What's he referring to with technological revolution? Computerization. Computerization, okay, a contributing factor to some of the changes you're talking about. <coughs> Other things that come to mind about any of the things he's uh, identified here? Mr. Ishbut, when, when he gave that address, how long ago was it? Uh, I'll check on that in just a minute. <laughs> Go ahead. I think um, possibly the uh, just the broad increase in um, worker productivity generally right. that you see across all industries. Okay. It, it eventually means fewer of them. Sure. So a smaller labor union right. movement by default. Right. Well, in this last paragraph, the, his doubt that the unions will revolutionize themselves right. is a comment. Right. Now, by the way, do you agree with that? What, what do, you, do you think this assessment is correct? Yes. Yes? Any optimists here? I see no reason to believe he's wrong. You see no reason to believe he's wrong. <laughs> he was going to um, give you reasons. And by the way, we could add to this list. We could talk about the global economy, among other things, uh, that actually nowadays is very difficult to organize when the employer has the very plausible threat of simply moving production to Mexico or China. This, again, increases the leverage, the power of management. Uh, and for all these reasons, it's a pretty bleak proposition. But you're getting at something uh, that actually is important here. And I, I really want you to underline this date because he was speaking in 1932. He was speaking in 1932. And the reason I put this in front of people is that very often when we look back at the 1930s, there's this presumption that it was inevitable that unions would grow, that protests would be successful. Because after all, the Great Depression was a time of such extraordinary suffering. High unemployment, unemployment of roughly 50% in the city of Detroit. Nationally, about 25%, but very severe here and in other centers where heavy metal working uh, and complex metal machines were the principal product. Uh, and I put this up here because this man was wrong. This man was dead wrong. But on the other hand, this was the characteristic notion about the prospects for union revival and growth in 1932. This was part of a chorus of a presumption that unions were obsolete and that they would not be able to revolutionize themselves. And George Burnett was a smart man. There was a lot of evidence that reinforced this presumption. For example, most of the unions that existed at that time were part of the old American Federation of Labor. There was no CIO, we'll come to that in a bit. It was just the American Federation of Labor. And most of the unions, not all of them, but the predominant unions, the dominant unions in the American Federation of Labor were very exclusive in their presumptions about who were appropriate members of their organization. They principally organized around Kraft. And you see here the basis for that presumption that Kraft was the dominant and important part of the workforce uh, to be concerned with. This is 1905, this is in Detroit, one of over a hundred auto companies back then, very small scale, assembling cars by hand with very little supervision. The blueprints are underneath these hats. These are skilled workers who are self-directed, and each of the cars they're producing, one after the other, is different in innumerable ways. These, by, by the way, most of these guys were called fitters. That's because they got very crude forgings, which they would then hand file and assemble because they knew how the damn thing went together. They're the people who developed the auto industry. 
and produced the, uh, the automobile which would later be produced on a mass production basis. But they remained basically oriented exclusively towards skill, uh, skilled workers long after it had changed to this. And this is the Ford Highland Park plant, 1916. These workers would be hired specifically <laughs> with the intention of finding those who knew nothing about metalworking, had no previous skill, no previous union organization. What you see here is the Model T factory in Highland Park, and this is a gravity feed with gas tanks, which these guys are bolting in, one after the other, all day long, that's all they do, and have no conception of the production process preceding or following it, in most cases anyway. And these workers were ones which those craft unions refused to organize. They said, these are not appropriate, this is not appropriate material for our high-end elite group of workers who dominated the old production system of craft production, but are becoming now less and less relevant to mass production, except for, of course, their role in the tool room. This is the predominant workforce, but they're immigrant, and a lot of these AFL unions were very exclusive uh, with that regard. They would not organize immigrant workers. They were not interested in the skill, uh, excuse me, in the unskilled production workers. And many of them were whites only. 